or a visit with someone, you know, in person or over Zoom or whatever. It could be very, very kind of small scale and be 100% satisfying. So there's a big difference between being lonely and being alone. And so anything we can do to get some of that social into us, it doesn't mean that introverts have to go to parties. It just means we have human connection, connection that makes us feel happy. And surprisingly, that helps us live longer. And one thing that a lot of us don't want to do, we don't want to drink a lot of water, especially before bed, because we don't want to get up in the night to go to the bathroom. I don't want to go to the bathroom. I don't want to take a risk of falling. Um, and you don't have to drink a lot before bed, but you got to drink a lot of water. As we get older, dehydration is much more frequent and much more dangerous. Dehydration can lead to urinary tract infections. It can lead to delirium, confusion. So drink water. You don't have to chug a gallon of water, but just having some water throughout the day, super good for you because I have personally seen two of my ladies get so dehydrated. They were babbling incoherently, super confused, wacky. And I just sat with them two different times, two different women, drink, 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 calm right down. Everything's okay. They didn't have you know, some major brain problem, they just were dehydrated. And so make sure to drink a lot of water because you definitely don't want to get an infection. You don't want to be all mixed up or faint or something. One super great thing for your brain is music. And Emily's going to talk a lot more about music, but try to get some of your favorite music into your life. However, whatever way you get music, if it's CDs, if it's Spotify, you know, however you get music, listen to music and sing along, especially if someone in your life has dementia. People with dementia remember their favorite music all the way to the end. They can sing the lyrics, they remember the music, they can move, you know? And so ways you can do that, you can think of your favorite songs, that's great, your favorite artists, that's great, but also think about what are your favorite musicals or what's your person's favorite musical or commercial jingle or songs from childhood. TV theme songs are really, really fun to think about. You can sing together, you can talk about the music, you can dance, you can laugh, you can enjoy music together. Music is miraculous. And so one of our programs that we offer is called Music and Memory. As I mentioned, we give personalized iPods to older adults, particularly those with dementia, but including other chronic illness. And what's really fascinating when someone has dementia, and they hear their favorite music. And it, it's really the key is favorite music, but it makes you happy just like the rest of us. We all get happy when we hear our favorite song, but it also reduces anxiety, agitation, depression. It gives them something to do. And in addition, it gives the caregiver a break because they're listening to their music and having a lot of fun and the caregiver can take a little break and rest. So if you, if you have anyone in your life that you think might benefit from some personalized music on an iPod, um, you are welcome to reach out to, to either one of us. We have a program called Dementia Friendly Activities, and those are activities specifically for people with dementia and their caregivers. If someone in your life has dementia, think about inviting them to join us. It's free. It's a blast. All we do is pick a theme and talk about it. We have talked about each of these themes and you're welcome to contact us if you know someone, but even in your own life, either among your own family members, or even if you have someone in your life with dementia, you can talk to them. People with dementia can carry on conversation. So right now, this is one of those the screens that we showed. We showed this slide of chocolate chip cookies. And right this second, every one of us knows what this tastes like. We know what it smells like. We wanna reach in and grab one or all of them and eat them. Well, we showed this slide and I'm telling you, our friends with dementia talked really for a long time about cookies, how much they love cookies. Now they can't answer specific questions like what are the ingredients in this cookie or who made this cookie or anything like that, but they can talk about cookies and you can too, you know, think about it around your house, things that smell good, talk, you know, grab things that smell good and smell them and talk about them. You can talk about animals. When we showed the picture of this dog to our guests that had dementia, oh boy, they had so much to say about this dog. I know where he's going. 
I know what he's going to do next, you know? Oh, I can tell. I know what he's thinking. It was just really fun. And the funniest one was I showed this picture of the sheep. It took up the whole screen. And I don't know anything about sheep. I'm a city person. They talked and talked and talked about how dumb sheep are. And I didn't know sheep were dumb. But apparently, sheep are like the dumbest animal. And they had story after story about sheep. It was hilarious. Or you can grab videos or images off of the internet and just talk about animals. There's unlimited funny videos on the internet about animals. We showed one about a koala in Australia that got into this guy's car and wouldn't get out. And the guy's trying to get the koala out and he just gouged the dashboard. It was hilarious. Anyway, but you can at, talk about that. Would you rather feed a giraffe or hold a koala? You know, just making conversation can be really, really fun. Another thing that's really fun, whether or not you have dementia, is listening to TV theme songs. All of these songs and shows bring up so many memories. And while our guests with dementia didn't remember the shows or what they were about, they remembered every one of these songs. And when the Adams Family song came on, they all went doo 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 doo. They all snapped along. It was so fun. Music stays inside your brain and it's fun to listen and reminisce and talk. And you can also figure, you know, talk about anything with any of the seasons. You can go outside and collect things. You can look out the window. You, every season has some sort of holiday or event or something that is really, really fun to talk about. So we've, we talk, we've talked about all of these things. So if someone has dementia, please try to be really careful about, don't say, don't you remember, don't you remember, or who's this in this picture? What is this? Come on, you're not gonna jog their memory. When you have dementia, you have brain damage. You, you're not gonna help them. And just like all of us, if someone says to me, don't you remember, and I don't, I feel frustrated. I don't like that, you know, it, it's irritating. It's, it's sad, I feel dumb. So we don't do that when someone has dementia, but you can keep it really, general talk about the senses Ooh, what does that smell like Ooh, what does that feel like you know what does that sound like big general questions oh what do you think about that what do you like about that and if you're trying to create conversation asking yes or no questions doesn't do anything um do you like this yes there's no conversation there and so thinking about big questions and if you look at pictures like you can look at um famous works of art or images or on the internet or anything but like in this picture with the horses oh where do you think they're going what do you think i mean it looks like that black horse is flying what do you think that's about or it looks like the white horse is between those that narrow fence those two narrow fences what do you think that's about you know where do you think they're going what are they doing you know big questions like that and that is a way to carry on a conversation with someone who has dementia, because that can be kind of a tricky thing to navigate if you've never done it before. Another thing seniors can do if they'd like to kind of expand their group a little bit or in all this isolation we've had over the last couple of years, what can we do? Well, the senior centers have unlimited classes. The breadth of the classes they offer is so wide. It's incredible. They have online classes with the virtual senior center. They have these classes, you know, these health classes, um, like we're doing today. They have all kinds of things in person. They've got a $3 lunch. I mean, it's fantastic. And all their activities are free. It's just a great place to meet people. It's a great place to have something to do. If you have someone in your life or you yourself struggle with some sort of an issue, any kind of issue, consider finding a support group. So, as I mentioned, we offer support groups for people who take care of someone with dementia. Um, Salt Lake County Aging has a wonderful calendar with a variety of support groups listed. Find a group. There's someone that has something in common with what you're going through, and it might be really helpful to join. There's all sorts of Zoom classes and groups, all kinds of like, you can do pretty much any kind of vacation type tour. You can see the museums, the local libraries have classes or book clubs or 
all kinds of things. And then there's something called meetup groups, which is kind of a fun thing. You go to meetup group, you type that into your Google and you type in your zip code and all kinds of groups pop up. It might be a hiking group, a lunch group, a book club, a walking group, and you can connect with people with whom you have something in common. But again, getting that extra little bit of social in a time where it's hard, it's hard to find people, it's hard to meet people. Getting in touch with other people, again, helps us be healthier, helps us live longer, and it's super fun. I know someone who not long ago moved to Utah and he didn't know anybody. He clicked on the meetup group and he found a walking group that he liked or a hiking group and got all connected with people, really worked out great. So now Emily's gonna talk a little bit about music and what music can do for us. Thank you, Rosemary. Am I coming through okay? Perfect. Okay, great. So Rosemary has talked a lot about, um, you know, this amazing thing of music being something that somebody with dementia, they're still really good at. So I just wanted to um, share a little bit with you about why that is and um, why we're using music as some of our, um, for some of our main programming at Jewish Family Service. Um, go ahead, Rosemary. There we go. Um, so if I were to sing to you, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. And if you were to sing along with me, our brains are really busy doing a whole bunch of different things. Our brain is processing the pitch, da 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 da. It's pulling up the lyrics that you um, probably have memorized. It's pulling those up. You might have um, specific memories or uh, people or emotions associated with that song. Maybe your grandma always sang that song to you, and when you hear it, you think of your grandma. So your brain's pulling up those memories and those associations. It's working on rhythm. It's got the tempo you know, like the pulse, but it also has da, 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 So it's got two, two layers of rhythm going on there. Um, if you're singing it, your brain is making sure that your body's doing everything it needs to do to sing. So there's a lot that happens when we make music, even when we're just listening to music and even more so when we're actually making the music. All of that stuff happens in different areas of the brain. Um, there's not like a music center where it's all happening. It's just happening all over the place. So we talk about music being a global experience. There aren't very many things in our life that stimulate so much of the brain at the same time as music. So uh, when someone has dementia and, and parts of the brain are being damaged, gradually more and more damaged, um, there are still healthier areas of the brain. And fortunately, in those areas, a lot of music is being processed. Go ahead, Rosemary. So you, you know the uh, real estate, you know, location, location, location. That's kind of how it is. Music is being processed in these locations in the brain that are not being damaged by the disease. So music remains a strength for someone who has dementia. They're able to do, they're able to tap along and clap out rhythms. They're able to remember lyrics and memories that are associated with songs. They're still able to sing and remember, remember all the words for a long time into the disease. So we wanna just take advantage of this ability. There are so many things that aren't working with dementia that if we have something that is working, like we wanna use it and we can use it for so many more things than just sort of entertainment, music can be really, really useful in our lives. We can kind of be purposeful about why, why and how we're using music. Um, go ahead, Rosemary. Oh, play to your strengths. I already said that. Okay, you can click past that. <laughs> so one of the things we have at uh, Jewish Family Service is the Gleeful Choir. It's a choir for people who have dementia and their caregivers. Um, go ahead, Rosemary. Here's a picture of us. Pre-pandemic, we were, we were up to about 30 people before the pandemic came along, but still over Zoom, we're still at about 15, so we're, we're hanging in there. But this choir is great because um, it's great for the person who has dementia because it's, like we said, it's a strength, it's something they can do and do well. It's great for the caregiver, and we're going to talk a little bit about all the benefits that come from singing and choral singing. And it's also great for people and their relationships. 
at choir, it's not so much like you're the caregiver and you're the person with dementia and I'm here to take care of you. It's like, oh, we're this couple and we're a choir and here we are together and we're having a grand old time. Whether it's a married couple or a parent-child, you know, lots of adult children are there with a parent maybe, or whatever the relationship may be, it's a time where you can just go have fun with your person, you know, and you step away from those roles a little bit. Uh, go ahead. There's a, a, great, a great study um, done in Europe. It was, gosh, about 1,200 people or so. Um, they interviewed and, and found out the benefits that they experienced because of choral singing. So I just loved all of these. They increased feelings of happiness and raised spirits and, and at the same time counteracted sadness and depression. It increases focus and concentration, which blocks worrying and relieve stress. Isn't that true? If you can get your brain on something good, it, it doesn't have all that freedom to go worry. <laughs> it increases your deep breathing, which also counteracts worry and stress. It offers social support and friendship, which decreases feelings of isolation and loneliness, which Rosemary talked about. Um, it involves education and learning and gives you a sense of achievement, which counteracts decline of cognitive functions. And the commitment to attend rehearsals just takes some physical activity to get up and get in the car and go. So, you know, we're not doing in-person choir right now, but we still experience all of these benefits um, on our online choir. It's not like traditional choir. It's actually shifted more to, a, I call it a music exploration group. Because you can't sing, I don't know if any of you have tried it, but if you're on Zoom, you really can't sing with a group together. There's all these timing issues and everybody is coming in at different times. So we do a lot of singing, but people are muted. They just hear my voice and their own voice. Um, so it's a little hard to get used to, I would imagine, sitting in your living room singing to a computer screen. But there's just some of the benefits of singing, you know, that help, help us with our emotional state and our cognitive state. Um, that even doing it that way, it still works. Okay, go ahead, Rosemary. I love this quote. Singing is uh, the, an infusion of the perfect tranquilizer, the kind that both soothes your nerves and elevates your spirit. So it's kind of like that. Like you get both at the same time, which is a pretty neat kind of, um, if we want to call it a tranquilizer, something that has a neat effect on us. Okay, go ahead. Okay, here's a picture of the choir now. This is what we look like on our Zoom screen. And everybody just logs on. Sometimes some of our members are clear across the country. We're all over Salt Lake. Um, I'm up in Ogden. And we do all kinds of things. Um, I, I kind of explained to you about how we sing. We also sing in rounds. We'll play um, a round on a YouTube video so you can hear like voice one, and then maybe I will come in with each person in their own little living room, we'll come in as voice two. And it kind of gives that illusion of singing in a choir. It gives that kind of harmony experience. So that's, that's really fun. We do a lot of movement to music, um, rhythmic patterns, body percussion, where we're clapping and snapping and doing things like that. We do um, collaborative songwriting, where we all toss out ideas and create songs together. We play a lot of different musical games. We learn about different artists or different types of music or stories behind songs. Um, we do a lot of it sharing back and forth about like songs that are meaningful or why was that meaningful or what did that remind us of. And in a way, meeting through Zoom, we've kind of gotten to know each other better than we did in a choir setting, at least it's just different. We're getting to know each other in different ways because we have that chance to sort of talk to everyone about what we remember. Sometimes we do show and tell and we'll bring different things. Sometimes we'll bring, you know, hats or, you know, whatever, all kinds of things that um, are just fun and, and are able to, we're able to share with everyone parts of our lives. So it's a great group. It's a lot of fun. We have people in the choir who, um, one family who started the choir with the mom who had dementia and her husband and the two adult children would come. Well, the mom with dementia passed away, the two adult children and the dad who didn't have dementia kept coming because the dad, it was his support group. 
And then when he passed away, the two adult children still come. So um, it's just a lot of fun, um, a great way to, to make new friends and to make music while you're doing it. Okay, Rosemary. All right, so so that's one thing. This is that is something that the J Jewish Family Service offers. Here's just some some helpful hints for you in your daily life with music. So I'm a music therapist, and um, the idea with music therapy music therapy is that we are using music in a really intentional way to work on maybe a non musical goal, like maybe. Um, increasing conversation between people. Maybe it's decreasing agitation. Maybe it's um, you know, improving depression. We're using music as a tool to make these things happen. For my uh, graduate program in gerontology, I did a, um, my graduate project was on something called music therapeutic caregiving. And uh, what they found is that for people who have dementia, who are resistant to care, so meaning if you're the caregiver and you're trying to help them comb their hair or brush their teeth or do whatever, sometimes people are really resistant to that. And that makes life really hard for everybody. It makes hard for you, life hard for you as a caregiver. And um, if you're the person with dementia, a lot of times we guess that there's feelings of confusion and frustration and not knowing what's expected that makes people kind of lash out a little bit, which isn't a great place to be in either. They found that when the caregiver sings familiar songs to the person with dementia that they're caring for, all of these different changes happen with the person. First of all, that resistant behavior, which is sometimes combative behavior, that really goes way, way down when you're singing. And it's got to be music that they know and love, not just any old music, okay? But you're singing to them these songs that they have an emotional, like a positive emotional connection to. Um, those combative behaviors go down. Eye contact is increased. A lot of times they found that the person with dementia is able to speak better when that's happening, which was really interesting. Um, another really interesting finding, that I, I based my research on this, this group of researchers in Sweden who studied this for like 10 years and they did lots and lots of different studies looking at different aspects of care. And one of the interesting things was it affected the person with dementia, how they held and understood their body, like the caregiver was singing to them and the person with dementia had a better understanding of their environment. They knew that they were supposed to put their arm in their sleeve. They knew to line up the buttons and to try to button them up. And it was interesting because normally the caregiver would be, um, you know, listing off, now do this, now do this, let's see your arm, here's, here's this. Well, the caregiver was busy singing, so they couldn't give instructions. But even though there was, the instructions weren't being given, the person with dementia seemed to have an increased understanding of what, what the setting was and what was expected of them. And, oh, I know that I'm supposed to you know, put the toothpaste on the toothbrush, and here we go. And they knew to walk across the bathroom to the sink. Like, all of that stuff just kind of kicked in as that music was introduced. The caregivers also had a different experience. They felt this sense of connection with the person. As you think about the act of singing to someone, it's really a nurturing thing to do. I mean, it's just kind of like the mother-child thing as a, as a mother singing to a child. It doesn't even have to be the mother-child. It could be one person sharing music with another and looking in their eye and just having fun and singing to them, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine, you make me happy, you know? It's just a really nice way to communicate and caregivers felt this increased sense of communion, they called it, with, to the person that they were um, caring for. So these studies were done with professional caregivers and their job satisfaction went way up because they had a shift in how they felt towards the, um, the person they were caring for. So it was really fascinating and so simple. You know, it's just like the simplest Thing we can put in our toolbox as we're caring for people with dementia to just sing to them. It, make eye contact, um, you know, not, not doing it in a distracted way like you're bored and you're singing, but like you're really looking into their eyes and singing to them, I think really gives them a feeling of being special and valued and it just kind of changes the dynamic. So if any of you are in that situation, I just encourage you to try it out. If you are uncomfortable singing, Go ahead and play some background music. This is where what Rosemary, our music and memory program, um, really comes in handy. 
um, in these studies I was telling you about, sometimes they studied the caregiver singing and sometimes they studied just having background music on and both were helpful and effective. So if you feel uncomfortable singing or maybe you don't know the kind of music that they like or the music from that era, you can play some of that music. It'll kind of give you some support. You can sing along a little bit, but just for the person with dementia, having that familiar music that they know what to expect and what's going to happen, and it will hopefully bring up a lot of positive emotions if you've got the right kind of music, if you've got their music, that's really, really important. It's not just any music, it's gotta be the music that they have a positive relationship with. Whoever their favorite artists were or whatever their favorite types of music, that's what we wanna choose. And just a side note, um, music is so powerful in bringing up positive emotions. It also can be powerful in bringing up negative emotions. For example, I've been, I've been singing You Are My Sunshine. Well, one of the hospice patients I worked with, she sang that to her husband as he died. So as I began the song, she just stopped me and said, please, please don't sing that song. It brought up all this grief for her. And sometimes that will happen for sure. That's happened with World War II vets who had really bad wartime experiences and um, that popular music from that era brought up all of that. So you have to be careful and just um, watch for the responses. I mean, if it makes them sad, you're gonna be able to tell, so stop <laughs> and switch. Um, if it makes them happy, you're gonna be able to tell. You just have to observe and watch and not just blindly you know, throw on music from 1950 that you think is gonna be great. Um, there might be one song here or there that somebody has a negative connection to. And so we just watch people's responses and kind of move ahead, paying attention to what's going on. Okay. Let's see, let's go to the next slide. All right, so um, we've just started a new group at, at Jewish Family Service. This isn't really a group for folks with dementia. This is for anybody who is an older adult. Um, there's a whole field that's coming into its own more and more called creative aging. And researchers are finding that people who engage in creativity have all of these health benefits they have physical health benefits, like um, less visits to the doctor and taking less medications. Those were a couple of the findings that some of the studies found. They have emotions or um, positive effects on people's emotions. So people score better on uh, depression measures or anxiety measures, it helps people in that realm. It helps people to um, delay or I, I guess have less cognitive decline. So there's studies who have watched people over the course of years and compared different groups, and they found that people who are creatively engaged have less cognitive decline. So it helps keep your mind sharp. It's a way to connect with other people. And I think after this year, these past two years with COVID, as we've seen how isolation can actually be really deadly for people as we've watched what's happened in our facilities and people haven't been able to connect with others and their family. Um, we can't just minimize the effect that social connection has on our health, our physical health, our emotional health. So people who go to the, you know, are in a choir together, go to an art exhibit together, take a class together, that's all social connection and it's really good for all aspects of your health. So um, yeah, creativity in, in any way, it could be passive, like it, that means, you know, you're sort of receiving the art. You go to the art exhibit and you look at the art. You go to the concert and you listen to the music. You go to the theater and you watch the play. Those are all really good for you. And then there's the more active side where you are painting, where you are drawing, where you are playing an instrument, where you are singing. That's great for you too. They both have different benefits that come from doing either of those things. So um, we thought we'd start a creativity group. It's called Exploring Creativity. We have it every Wednesday at 1030. Um, the first, oh, thanks. Yeah, the first Wednesday of the month, we introduce a new art form and try it out a little bit. And then the remaining weeks of the month, we just get, whoever wants to get together, if they like it and want to do more, we'll, we're just going to call it an open studio. This is kind of a new group um, where you can just show up and work on stuff. And then the next month, we'll do something new. Poetry, art, music writing, storytelling, all different types of art so that you have a chance to try out different things and find something that really speaks to you. Um, so yeah, 
I don't know if you can see my, oh, yep, yeah, right up there in the corner is my email address. You're welcome to um, just send me an email or even call, and I can get you invited, send you a Zoom link to the class, um, if, and we can help you with Zoom. If Zoom is um, something that's hard or you haven't done, we can meet beforehand and, help, and get you all set up on Zoom. And um, yeah, just get to know the other people in the class who are also wanting to improve their health by being creative. So you're all invited to do that. It's a free class. Um, really targeted at beginners. You don't have to have ever created art before. So any, anybody's welcome. And I think that's, that's all that I have, Rosemary. I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. 